It is common to ask what wonders we might find while exploring space, what new civilizations we might encounter, but what would the galaxy be like once we explore and colonize it if we never meet anyone else out there? So today our topic is the future of the galaxy if humanity truly is the first technological civilization to arise in it, something we touched on briefly last year in our episode on uplifting. That was a two part collaboration episode with John Michael Godier, and while with two episodes we got to spend more time on the topic, both John and I felt that there were a lot of implications about the future of the galaxy that we brushed against but need more explanation. We can contemplate exploring space and settling the galaxy and what the solution to the Fermi Paradox will be if we will meet anyone out there, but often what comes after gets skipped. What is the galaxy like after you've explored and settled it? What challenges does a galactic wide civilization face, and can you even have such a thing? This is what John and I will be trying to tackle today. To do that we must first discuss the Fermi Paradox. Of course the Fermi Paradox is a familiar topic for regulars of either of our channels, but discussion tends to focus mostly on reasons why alien civilizations aren't being seen by us. The core of the Fermi Paradox is that it simply seems peculiar that a universe as old and gigantic as ours could be absent of other intelligent life, it seems paradoxical. Many solutions have been proposed for handling this, but most focus on why these civilizations emerge often enough but can't be seen by us, either because they are hard to see or have ceased to exist. We spend a lot of time discussing these proposed solutions and their merits and flaws, but the alternative, that we are the first civilization to emerge in our region of the Universe, is going to be our focus for today. Not so much the reasoning behind that solution, but what its consequences might be, what a galaxy might look like down the road if humanity was the first civilization to emerge and went out and colonized the whole place and perhaps beyond. Particularly the notion that we might encounter other alien civilizations that just happened to emerge during that colonization period, as improbable as that would seem if no one else had in the billions of years before that, this scenario is actually quite likely, for a given definition of the term alien. From the perspective of the Fermi Paradox, this sort of scenario is possible under what is generally known as the Rare Earth Hypothesis, the basic notion being that while there are billions of galaxies, each host of billions of stars, resulting in billions of billions of planets, the conditions for life to emerge on those is quite rare. This is usually broken down into the idea that life emerging might be ultra-rare, that the evolutionary path to intelligence and technology might be ultra-rare, or that such civilization surviving to colonize the Universe, and choosing to do so, is ultra-rare. But none of these are exclusive. For instance, it could be life emerging happens on maybe only one in a million planets, leaving millions of planets in our galaxy alone, which are inhabited or were at some point. Yet of those, perhaps the evolutionary pathway to high intelligence is so uncommon that only one in a million planets have achieved that thus far. It may never occur, as their sun may die or strip off their oceans or atmosphere before that happens, or it may be that they just need more time. The universe might seem old, at nearly 14 billion years, but in truth it is barely into the stellar era and stars will be regularly forming for at least a trillion more years and the heavier atoms needed for rocky planets and biochemistry will continue to grow more common as time goes on. If only one in a million planets has ever hosted life, and only one in a million saw it reach higher intelligence, then those two combined would make it improbable any other civilization besides our own has yet arisen in this galaxy. These barriers to life forming and reaching intelligence are collectively referred to as filters, and we will often refer to great filters, a given filter that is particularly improbable, lottery odds. One of those that has been suggested is that even if intelligence develops fairly often, this does not necessarily lead to abstract thinking and conceptualizing, let alone serious technology. After all, there are many species on Earth that have fairly large brains and had them as long as various hominids have, but not done much with them. 
even of the hominids, humanity and its nominally extinct neo-human cousins or predecessors like Neanderthal and Homo erectus sat around with brains fairly parallel to our own for many thousands of years without doing much technologically. We've had fire for around a million years, but using fire for pottery and metalworking are quite recent, and it is entirely possible that many civilizations never go down that higher technology pathway rather than it being inevitable as we often think of it. Indeed we have plenty of historical examples, all of which come from long after civilization had already embraced a lot of technology and innovation, like ancient Rome, where new technologies were simply not used even though they knew its benefits and in no way doubted that technology's effectiveness. Quite to the contrary, they often felt using it would ultimately hurt them more than it helped. Those of us living nowadays know all too well the advantages of technology, but also its perils, and unlike our ancestors, we don't particularly have to worry about dying early of sickness, starvation, or other hardships if we decline to embrace a new one like artificial intelligence. So if many civilizations decline to use beneficial technology even while having to endure those hardships, it may be plausible that some opt to avoid one technology or even all further progress out of a fear of the consequences of using it, reasoning things are good enough as is. That fear represents one of our two remaining filters of the Fermi Paradox humanity hasn't hit yet, that we might destroy ourselves long before colonizing other solar systems. The other one is that colonizing other systems might turn out to be impossible, impractical, or undesirable for some reason. All of these filters add into the general rare earth hypothesis for the Fermi Paradox, that the galaxy seems to be an empty place not because we can't see other civilizations but because there simply are not any, or the handful that exist stuck on their homeworld or near enough that they haven't left an obvious footprint for us to detect yet. This scenario is our main focus for today, as we ask what the future will be like if it is the right solution, and those last two filters, self-destruction or not colonizing the galaxy, are ones we overcome. In this regard, we will also be examining why so many of the other solutions to the Fermi Paradox just don't seem to work, if such civilizations are indeed common. As best as we can tell, we are not too likely to find colonizing other planets in our solar system an insurmountable barrier or one that folks decline to do. If you can do that, then you have the option of making generational arc ships to colonize other systems, even if you don't get far superior drives which might let you get ships up to near light speed, or maybe even somehow surpass it with a warp drive or wormholes or other faster than light FTL methods. It would also seem improbable any natural disaster could destroy your civilization at this point. As to unnatural disasters, like artificial intelligence, or humanity being replaced by cyborgs or genetically engineered superhumans, realistically this doesn't much matter to the Fermi Paradox since you are usually just replacing one aggressive and advanced species with another that's more aggressive and advanced and thus even better at colonizing the galaxy. Of course you might have an AI that was non-expansionist just taking over Earth, but if you have already colonized your solar system, that won't wipe you out and you can just expand into the galaxy while it sits on Earth doing whatever amuses it. If we are assuming this galaxy is devoid of life, then we have the whole place to ourselves, and while those planets aren't naturally hospitable to life, there should be billions that are much easier to terraform than Mars or Venus. Alternatively, if the galaxy isn't devoid of life, just technological civilizations, we have to decide what to do with those inhabited planets. In some ways, what we think we would like to do informs us of what aliens might do, and it's one of our approaches to the Fermi Paradox. If it makes sense to us to do something, it might be likely aliens or future humanity would act that way too. Of course, there are limits on that. An alien mind is likely to demonstrate alien behavior, and it is worth remembering that while we, nowadays, can't wait to explore the cosmos and meet new civilizations and learn about them, quite a few of our ancestors would not have shared that desire entirely. Like us, they were curious, a trait we'd expect any technological civilization to share, but they might have wanted to encounter new civilizations so they could take their planets and sacrifice them all to the sun god in thanks. 
In our last collaboration, we discussed the concept of uplifting, which is where you take something like a dolphin or a chimpanzee and modify it to be smarter and able to handle technology. In those episodes, we defined three types of uplifting, technological, physiological, and mental, none of which are exclusive either. You could encounter a species with all they need for technology except that technology, like early Homo sapiens, and technologically uplift them. For something like chimpanzees, you'd also need to mentally uplift, enhance their brains a bit. For something like dolphins, you'd need to physiologically uplift them too, giving them hands or digits on their fins to handle objects. One might opt to do all of the above, or even just one, like giving chimpanzees bigger brains but not technology, just to see if they got it on their own. This is one way in which we could encounter alien civilizations, by making them. And indeed, you might send out sophisticated probes in advance of colonization waves to do just that. We often discuss how you might colonize the galaxy by sending out automated probes to do the initial work, and it seems common sense to include an ability to detect inhabited planets so you don't end up accidentally terraforming the planet some of the critters already live on. Potentially, such a probe might have orders to engage in uplifting instead, where it encounters something which might make a good candidate. As to why you might do that, we've also discussed the difficulties in quarantining a planet in the long term. Here's the problem, as we expand outward, possibly encountering inhabited but non-technological planets, we will obviously be curious about them. We also might decide we need to seal them off so nobody can exploit or tamper with them, but in the long term, that's a very hard policy to maintain, realistically, probably an impossible one as you'd be looking at maintaining a quarantine for potentially many millions of years before any civilizations might arise. That is a very long time to try to maintain anything unchanging, and it would only take one lapse for someone to sneak in past the quarantine and break it. We discuss the near impossibility of maintaining such a long-term quarantine in more detail in the Alien Civilization series episode, Smug Aliens. So you might decide that path of doing the least harm would be just to tell your probes to uplift anyone they encounter who is over whatever threshold you deem right, and to go ahead and terraform any planet that is just basic microbes, grabbing samples for study later. They could be a threat to you, but if your probes aren't all that far ahead of your colonization waves, it's very unlikely, even if they are given all of your technology, that they'd be some sprawling interstellar empire who could knock you over. You had a big head start after all. You're already out colonizing worlds, and your probe at most only carries the most recent technological updates it got from home, which if it is a few thousand light years away, is now as far out of date technologically as our ancestors a few thousand years ago who thought bronze was the best stuff ever. Even if they're not grateful for the boost up, any uplifted civilization we spawn would presumably be rather intimidated by their creator species who they know already had a million colonized systems when the probe arrived, and whose awesome technology is probably considered antique junk by its makers. However, one hardly has to encounter aliens to do uplifting, and this is where we start needing to talk about how humanity is a fairly ambiguous term in regard to a future galactic civilization. Even if Earth is where that all starts from, which is arguably still the case if some of those life forms had originated on alien planets and had been uplifted, they're essentially the adopted children of Earth. Human, or person, or citizen are all rather hazy concepts when you start going outside a modern context. Who's more human? An alien raised on Earth who went to school here, eats our cuisine, coaches a baseball team, and watches our films and TV, or a human raised on its native planet with its customs and traditions. We could hand wave that away by pointing to something like DNA, but a cyborg, or a human mind uploaded into an android or just a virtual world, has no DNA. What's more, as we go out and colonize space, even if folks weren't very proactively using genetic engineering or transhumanist pathways, which they likely will, we'd diverge a lot from each other. Same as a species cut in half when a land bridge melts between two lands, living on alien worlds scattered around the galaxy is going to result in a lot of divergence, 
all the more so since those are alien worlds, alien suns, alien geology and weather and day length and so on. Such processes take thousands of generations, but then so too does colonizing a galaxy at sublight speeds. And again, that's under normal conditions. You start playing around with genetics and cybernetics and uplifting, especially if you're trying to adapt people to live in alien environments, and your timeline gets expedited. You could be a ship's captain who dropped some colonists off somewhere and came back to that planet a thousand years later expecting the colonists to have mutated a bit. You're expecting them to show some characteristics that would represent a new ethnicity, maybe with some unique phenotypes like purple hair or orange eyes, but instead find people walking around on six legs who insist they are human. Considering our hypothetical captain is a thousand years old, implying life extension technology, someone might come out to greet us from the original colonists, still looking fairly human perhaps, and shooing off their six-legged great-grandchildren. Indeed, things are just as likely to be changed back on Earth, if not more so. Colonies might be loaded up with adventurous mindsets, but they'd still only possess a small fraction of Earth's diversity and technological might. You get back to Earth and send a report to the Secretary General about how disturbed you are at the Six-Legged Humans, and he might reply back with a note sharing your concerns and asking to meet to discuss it in person. You go see him and are rather taken aback to see a dolphin, and when you let your surprise slip, he reacts angrily and demands to know what you have against your Europans. Uplifted dolphin cyborgs having been around Earth and the various icy moons of our solar system so long it doesn't even occur to him that you're a speciesist so he just assumes you're angry about someone whose family migrated from Jupiter's moon Europa being the Secretary General of Earth. If you headed off to the Orion Nebula, a mere 1300 or so light years away, practically in our backyard in galactic terms, you might meet humans who looked entirely human, but had assimilated into the culture of the Orions, once raccoon-like creatures they'd uplifted and who modified themselves to be human form but kept their basic culture and brain architecture and who hated modern authors as physiologically impure. 10,000 years ago they were animals running around forests, and 8,000 years ago they were smart raccoons learning technology from their human friends, and decided to tinker with themselves to look more humanoid, and became so obsessed with that body type as a sign of civilization that they eventually became entirely human in appearance, and are disgusted by anyone who isn't. Off on some other world, people didn't uplift dolphins or chimpanzees, they modified themselves into them and just kept their brains. They revealed the animal form but wanted to keep the intelligence, or maybe they meant to but that decayed, and now the Orions come by, see chimp-like primitives already somewhat humanoid, figure this is some planet that got quarantined rather than uplifted, and uplift them steadily into more human mind and form and teach them to loathe the non-humanoid, exactly opposite their ancestors' beliefs. And again it doesn't matter if we encounter primitive alien life or not, things like this can just happen by the sheer weight of time and distance to diverge, indeed even that distance might not matter much. You could easily see a far wider spectrum of divergence just inside a single solar system as time marches on. Time, in terms of the astronomical scale, is always hard to put into perspective. This is probably why so many sci-fi settings take place a few centuries to a few millennia ahead in time. But imagine for the moment that humanity sets off its first wave of colony ships in the year 2500, and that those move outward in an expanding sphere at about 10% of light speed. When you're going that slow, you don't bypass any system that is reasonably hospitable in search of close parallels to our own. So by the year 3000 you've settled everything within 50 light years, a speck so small it wouldn't even appear as a single pixel on a galactic map. And yet, There are about 2,000 stars in this volume, enough to make an empire already dwarfing most interstellar empires we see in fiction, and that's assuming they are only doing planets, not the various space habitats we'd expect as precursors to Dyson Swarms and Kardashev II civilizations. By 3500 AD, they are out to 100 light years and something like 16,000 stars. By 4000 AD, they are 150 light years out a sphere now just big enough to be a pixel or two on a galactic map, and continue over 50,000 stars. They are now as far ahead from us as we were to the early Roman Empire, and likely a lot more diverged from us and each other, likely a lot more different than modern Italy is from Spain or England, both prior colonies of Rome. 
Even the nearest of those stars is suffering far more communication and travel lag than any of those three countries ever had from each other. Most people, incidentally, probably still live back around our original star at this point, for although they have 50,000 other stars to call home, it is far easier to build artificial habitats around your own star than colonize worlds around others, and by now, even assuming they still stick to something recognizably humanish in appearance and manner, they could easily house 10 quadrillion people, simply by having the population double every century, and they'd still be nothing approaching a genuine Kardashev II civilization, which could easily house a thousand times that population. That's hardly fast growth either. Humanity quadrupled in the 20th century after all, hitting 6 billion right before the end of the millennia. It is 27% higher 18 years later, at 7.6 billion in 2018, but by the year 5000 AD they might have reached that full Kardashev II status back around Earth and our solar system, 10 million trillion people, while off in the leading edge of colonization they have reached 250 light years out, still a tiny dot on the galactic map, but one containing a quarter of a million stars. But back near Earth, things are already massively diverging, a trillion massive habitats, each effectively its own large island in space, is fertile ground for divergence of every aspect of mind and body. Even if things are peaceful and moving slowly, you'd expect to see thousands of those habitats where folks had focused on marine life, possibly had gills added, be it cybernetic or genetic, others where they'd modified themselves to low or no gravity and live in giant bubbles of air with floating homes and ecology adapted to drift around the endless sky. One who sneered at biology in favor of a pure cybernetic existence, or abandoned the physical entirely to live inside entire moons converted into computers, whose interior virtual landscape is so immense it would dwarf even a classic Dyson Sphere. They might be a small minority of civilization at this time, but each of those factions outnumbers humanity of the 21st century by an order of magnitude at least, and indeed, all the colonies combined, who themselves have precious little in common with each other. Now things change, and the classic image of sci-fi space opera totally shatters. In 5000 AD, the solar system is finally maxed out in population, and the earliest colonies are probably filling up the original worlds. Even now, every single colony, a quarter of a million systems, contains not even a single percent of humanity even if they've been breeding at a ferocious rate. This is still the early days of colonization, we are not even 1% done with the timeline for colonizing the galaxy and have not even 1% of people living outside our native solar system, and yet already we see an inevitable divergence, with countless factions back around our sun waiting to branch out even further and a quarter of a million sapling civilizations beginning to grow and branch out themselves, to envelop their own sun and to spread to new ones, even as in all likelihood vast armadas of colony ships launched from way back at Earth continue to head out further. You are still nothing like a galactic civilization, and you already face so much time lag and divergence that any concept like a unified civilization is nigh impossible and yet we've only begun to explore the scenarios and challenges for a galaxy-spanning humanity. John and I will continue that in part 2 over on his channel. Trying to wrap your mind around just how big the galaxy is, let alone the universe, is very difficult, and I think it's what damages a lot of science fiction that tries to paint a portrait of interstellar civilizations and our galaxy. They are not absorbing the sheer scale of things and the implications of what it would mean to civilizations. If you'd like to get a better grasp on the sheer scope of the galaxy and the universe beyond, then I'd recommend the course Sizing the Universe over at Brilliant.org. That will walk you through both the history of attempts to do it and our various methods for estimating size and distance nowadays, and will give you a much more intuitive feel for the scope of interstellar space and why so many forced glances at interstellar civilizations and fiction don't hold up well when taking into account those enormous quantities of stars spread over vast amounts of space and time. Any would-be space colonist is going to have to adjust their thinking to appreciate that enormity, and if you want to learn how to quickly understand it yourself, go to brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. 
and also the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Okay, next week we will be a little closer to home as we return to our discussion of orbital infrastructure in the Upward Bound series to explore the possibilities of transferring power down to Earth via power satellites. We were talking about colonizing our region of the galaxy today in Part 1 and how it would require immense numbers of ships, and we will be looking at those armadas of colony ships two weeks from now in Exodus Fleet. If you haven't already headed off to watch Part 2, there is a link on the end screen at the end of this video and one below in the video description. If you enjoy this episode, please like it and share it with others, and don't forget to subscribe to both my channel and John's for alerts about when new episodes come out, and I'll see you again in just a minute in Part 2.